computer. Reagan, welcome to the podcast. Devin, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Yay, thanks for matching my enthusiasm. I love it. <laughs> Reagan, I always like to start business in the front. Will you tell us about who you are in the world and what you do? Sure, I'm an intersectional fat activist. I speak and write full time about uh, things like body image, health at every size, medical advocacy, and weight stigma, and uh, especially the healthcare field, eating disorders, and fitness, because those are my little area of personal expertise. Um, I've been blogging at Dances with Fat since 2009 and uh, writing and speaking all over the place. My goodness, you are a treasure. It's so funny because I don't even know when we've met in person but i feel like i just like it's like you say 2009 i think maybe that's when you came into my consciousness but i just remember knowing of you until i finally got the chance to actually know you same z's <laughs> same z's actually um okay so you i want to i want to start with how did you find your way into fat activism and and i especially love that you use the term fat activism intersectionally um, cause so many identities intersect in the body. Um, but fat particularly is quite stigmatized. So tell me about how you came in to be a fat activist. Sure. It, kind of a wobbly path. So I started actually, um, looking for the very best diet. I was going to find the diet that worked the most and do that. And my background in college was research methods and statistical analysis. So I was like, oh, like, why don't I go through these studies and find the diet that works the most? And what I found was that there wasn't a single study where more than a tiny fraction of people were succeeding at long-term weight loss. And the studies themselves were like embarrassingly poor. Like there'd be a 70% dropout rate and 5% of the people would have lost five pounds or sorry, 30% of the people lost five pounds in two years. And they said, see, this diet is effective. And I kept being like, they would have thrown me out of school for doing research like this. How is this peer reviewed? And so I was at that point, not in an activism place, but just like, okay, like I'm a fan of math and logic. So obviously dieting is not a good call. Uh, so what else is there? And that's kind of how I found my way into health at every size. And then I was ballroom dancing competitively. And it had been kind of a whirlwind from like, we're dancing like country Western dancing in a gay bar for fun to like, we've decided to become a competitive couple uh, with my friend Andy. And so we had been learning all these dances and costuming and everything. And I got to my first competition and legitimately thought that the judging would be about my dancing naively. I don't know what I was thinking. And so I have a background in dance. I was a good dancer. And especially like in the newcomer category, a lot of people look like they might get sick while they dance because they're so nervous. They're brand new. I have been a cheerleader, a dancer. I was winking, smiling, arm stylings. And so um, the crowd was behind me. It was lovely. And then a bunch of judges came up and said things like, uh, you're going to lose weight, right? Like what a waste of talent at your size. And so, yeah, and so this became a thing. Another judge said he didn't feel that he could give me a higher score until I lost weight because I was just a poor example of a dancer. And so this kind of came to a head. I was at a competition and I was sick. And so I did my dances and I felt like crap and I didn't dance well. And I had all my stuff, all the gowns and makeup and shoes. And I'm trying to get back up to my hotel room. And this judge comes like charging at me at the elevator and basically like pins me up against the elevator. And she says, we have to talk about your waltz. And I was like, yeah, it wasn't good. And she's like, no, it's that dress. And I was like, I had this new dress and I loved it so much. It, I still have it. It's a black velvet dress with red embroidery and spaghetti straps. It's gorgeous. And she said, I couldn't stand to look at you. And I had that moment of like, do I want to be like, quote unquote, classy? Or do I just want to go off on this person? But I was sick and exhausted. So I just said, okay. And she said it again. I mean, I couldn't stand to look at you. And I said, okay. And so she stuck her finger in my face and she was like, you have no business wearing spaghetti straps. And it was in that moment as like, at least in my memory, her veins are bulging and spittle is flying and her face is red. I was like, oh, this has nothing to do with me, right? Nobody gets this mad about spaghetti straps. I don't care how last season that gown was, right? This is this person like, and trying to give me her issues for Christmas. And like, I want an air fryer. So no. Um, and so uh, then she said, well, I talked to your coach and he said, I could talk to you about this. And I was like, well, I'm 30. So you don't have to ask permission to talk to me. And I said, in truth, I probably won't choose to change the dress, but I do appreciate you taking the time to tell me it's such a problem for you. 
and her face got super red. And I thought for like a second that she was going to take a swing at me. Like I was trying to think like, should I drop my stuff? And she just turned around and kind of stormed off. And I had done a lot of activism work. I through my first protest in kindergarten. In college, I had done a ton of queer and trans activism, anti-racism work, but I'd never thought of being fat as being part of an oppressed group, right? I had realized like dieting isn't gonna work and I'm probably always gonna be fat, but what I wanted to do really was just be a fat dancer, but I realized I was gonna have to be a fat activist to get that done. <sighs> and so as a queer woman, I saw that sort of reflection of like, Right. People think that being queer is a choice and a bad choice and one I shouldn't make, but I'm not going to try to be not queer to please those people. So why have I spent so much time trying to be not fat to, to please those oppressors? So that was kind of the moment I became a fat activist. So I guess thanks to that judge, I you know should probably email her or something. But yeah, so that's the long story of how I got into this. I Oh my God. That's amazing. Um, it's so funny because like at the age that you were at that time, and like even in the time that that happened, um, I feel like I wouldn't have known how to react to that. But now I feel like I'm so rooted in like who I am and how I am in the world and where people's where people are coming from when they're saying and doing those things like that. Like it comes from this super deep trauma. Like nobody yells at you worse than they were yelled at. Um, I think and like it's it's so sad because you I can just see like the stacks of dance teachers yelling at this woman and probably pointing their finger in her face and all of the fat phobia she was just under and then there you were just waltzing and having a great time in that body that you had and like denying her the opportunity to <laughs> to oppress you basically and just standing up for yourself I love that that's you know what's interesting is like you do really powerful activist work but I think that moment might have been like a one of the more potent moments you've ever had just because in such an innocent way you were just protecting your energy from her vitriol and it like politicized you which I think is amazing and also it's just it's so I mean before you even have words or understanding for the framework that you're operating in to be at least have the self-esteem to stand up to that and like not receive it that's amazing Reagan. Oh, yeah, thank you. A lot of it is, I think, I call it like personality privilege. It just seems to be like how I was kind of came out of the factory, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being nurtured by my mom in that. But I did one thing that I think was really helpful is I, she walked away and I told everyone I knew what had just happened. Yeah. And it turned out she'd been doing it to a lot of fat dancers, but people were so ashamed that they wouldn't say anything. And so people were up in arms and they were like, do you want us to get her struck as a judge? Like, what do you, you know, do you want us to do a petition? Like, what do you want us to do? And I was like, no, no, like, just let her know it's not okay, you know, to do this. But like that, I feel like I was really incredibly lucky and privileged to get that support immediately from the people I went to and said like, I, you know, this person just told me she couldn't stand to look at me. I can't believe this happened you know, this is clearly bullshit and having people come back and be like, yeah, it absolutely was. Cause not everybody would agree with that. Some people would be like that, you know, oh, well, I guess you should do something about it. Like you should get that revenge body and show her. And it's like, no, no, this is already my revenge body. <laughs> like I'm dancing in it. Like as we speak. So, yeah. I'm dancing in my revenge body. Um, oh, I love that so much. Uh, so Reagan, tell me about, um, I'm, I'm very fascinated by your Iron Man pursuits. <laughs> and iron fat as it were um and will you tell me about because you when we hung out before you were talking about like you're very trophy motivated um I am not and so I find this fascinating and amazing and I love people who like dedicate themselves to do a thing and keep moving and you've been working towards an iron man for like many years now right I lost count. I'm in like the sixth or seventh year of my two year plan. This has been a start to finish debacle, this thing. Um, so yeah, I am like, I like to set big goals and to accomplish them just to do it. Mm -hmm. Like just to be like, okay, did that check. And so this is kind of how this started. Um, and also part of like my own self discovery. I've been a fat leap forever. as kind of a bigger kid fat as an adult, but I always only did things that I was good at immediately. Right. So I played basketball, I think once in fifth grade, have never played again. Right. Was no good at it. Saw no reason to continue doing it. 
And so one of the things I was always bad at was long distance running. I was like sprinting, jumping, throwing fine, long distance, terrible. And so like they asked me to join the track team when I was in school and to sprint and throw, which sounded fine. And then I got there and they're like, okay, we start each practice with a two mile warm up run. And I was like, I'll be seeing you. I quit in the first 10 seconds of track. <laughs> Cause I would like rather shave my head with a cheese grater than run two miles a day after school. So anyway, I, so I had this freak neck injury in like 2012 ish, 13 ish. And, um, I, the doctor was like, all the things you love to do, the dancing, the running, the jump, you can't do that anymore. He was like, you can do water aerobics, you can walk. And so I, water aerobics was still hurting my neck. So I was walking was what it was, but I'm just not like a take a walk kind of person. It just isn't peaceful to me. It isn't fun for me. I'm sort of like, am I going somewhere? Like, no, I'm just sweaty and back where I started. I don't understand why I would do that. And so I really needed a goal in order to get myself out there and doing this walking because I decided that's what I wanted to do to kind of support my body through this. And so I found out that in 20 weeks, which is about the time of my rehab, there was a marathon in Seattle where my best friend Kelrick lives. And so I started looking up like, well, has somebody my size like done a marathon? Like, what is this? And all I kept finding were like, if you are this size and think about doing a marathon, you need to lose weight first. And so I was like, fuck that. So I emailed Kelrick and said, do you want to do a marathon with me? Uh, because he is my amazing best friend. He emailed back immediately and just said, I'm in. And so I did this marathon and after it was done, you know, we did it. I did it. We did it together. And after it was done, I found out I could have gotten a Guinness world record for heaviest woman to complete a marathon. Oh, right? Which is cool. So I was like, great, I'll just send in my time and they'll give me another additional medal. But it turns out there's a lot of stuff you have to do. You can't do it retroactively. So then I had to do another marathon and I just couldn't get myself motivated to train again, right? I had done it. I had sworn never again. Um, and so I started listening to all these uh, audio books from endurance athletes to try to like pump myself up to train. And a lot of them had done Ironmans. And so a big part of this marathon emotionally was just like, okay, I've only ever done things I'm good at. What if I pushed outside of that comfort zone? And especially as a fat athlete, right? Because people, you know, trolls could come at me, oh, you're a terrible dancer, but it's like count the trophies, mm -hmm. right? But this, I was legitimately bad at by the, the scale of speed, which is what they measure by, right? So, um, so I was like, well, this Ironman thing would be the fullest expression of learning about outside of my comfort zone and doing sports I'm not good at, right? It's three things I'm not good at for a really prolonged period of time. So I decided to do it and found a coach who I had known from when I lived in Austin, Steve Blackman, who's been amazing and so patient and like found out that actually just getting dressed was harder than some of the training. Like they make one wetsuit in my size in the world, it seems I couldn't find a single other one. So like I own three of them because if they stopped production, I couldn't do the swim portion anymore. Like it's this whole thing where again, they keep telling fat people, Oh, you need to exercise, which is crap, right? Nobody's obligated to participate in fitness and it's not a barometer of worthiness. But if we do want to, then there are all these barriers to be able to participate. And so I had planned to do two years and then do this Ironman and it when I say debacle, it's not a strong enough word for what a disaster. I was like, I should have called my blog disaster triathlete instead of iron fat. Cause this is a mess. <laughs> like, first of all, I did not get faster at the speed that I thought I would, right. I was still phenomenally slow. And so the problem isn't the distances for me, it's the time limits of the Ironman. Mm. And then every time I was like, you know, six months out from doing the Ironman, something bad would happen. Like I got sick. My partner was hospitalized, you know, all of these things, COVID happened. I was, so I had decided, okay, I can't seem to, uh, meet these time limits with the training that I have. And I'm not willing to do more than I'm doing. So why don't I just set up my own course at home? Right. And I'll still do it. And well, I won't get like the official Ironman. I'll be an iron distance triathlete and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And so we had it set up. We had it planned. It was going to be in May of 2020. And then we went into quarantine in March of 2020. <laughs> and now I am fully deconditioned and have to decide to start this thing all over again or not. Um, and also the neck injury has progressed. So now after I get vaccinated, I get to have neck surgery and then fully rehabilitate from that point. So like, that's, that's the deal. You know what they call the person who took the longest to get to their actually finishing an Ironman? 
They still call them an Iron Man. Like it does not matter how long it takes you to get there. And also you can give up too. Like, it's so funny. Like we get to live these long lives and I feel like sometimes uh, I mean, the, the worst thing is to never start. Right. But like, also if it becomes the thing you don't want to pursue anymore, you can also not pursue it. But I love that you want to call it disaster triathlete. Cause like <laughs> it kind of is, it's like, it really is just like, how, how bad do you want it? The universe keeps saying. Um, but I was thinking about too, like when you were talking about, um, like your times and the distances, how much I love, um, I, just for the last year when I lived in LA, there was a fat girls hiking chapter there. And so I got to go hiking in that ethic with a group where we go as slow as the slowest person in the group. And it was a revelation to me. It was like everything I needed in Girl Scouts. It's everything I needed in outdoor education. It's just like, literally like we're just going as slow as the slowest person. And that's, and we'll get there, right? Like, and it's, so I feel like that's the Iron Man, <laughs> man that we really need is just that we'll get there. Like, <laughs> yeah. If, how long does it take to do an Iron Man? Like typically like. So the, time? the people who win do it Not in <laughs> like eight ish hours. The okay. maximum <laughs> you can take is 17 hours. Okay. It, I knew it was like a full day, like a long day. Yeah. 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 And so if you don't finish within 17 hours, they say, oh, you're our, an Iron Man in our hearts, but you're not technically an Iron Man. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, it's so it's so interesting because like I'm like this. I don't know why, but like this is how I am. But I also am constantly telling people like discover the joy of quitting, right? Like this is not you know, junior high softball, where like you join the team. So you keep that kind of like walk into the class and walk out, you know, start the YouTube video and never finish it, like try stuff and quit. And so I try to be clear, like, while I still want to pursue this goal right now, like if I ever were to quit, like there's no shame in that. No, nope. there's no shame in not finishing an Ironman. There's no shame in never trying to do an Ironman. People will say like, do you think everyone should do this? I'm like, I think maybe nobody should do it. Like, I think maybe they should stop having them so that those of us who make these bad choices maybe can't as easily. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's <laughs> like, this is a thing that I want to do. And I set the goal and, you know, today in this moment, I still want to finish it, but that might change. And it's possible that after the next surgery, I won't be able to pursue it. And like, that's that, like, it's, I'm not going to ruin my body for a random goal that I want to accomplish as much as I love medals and I do. Right. But yeah, I think it's really important that we're clear, like, and there's, so there's this whole community in racing called the back of the pack, right. And they're the people who are at the end and they're like Martinez Evans, 300 pounds and running yeah. uh, Myrna Valerio, um, Latoya Shante. So now they do incredible advocacy around back of the pack running. Um, and, but it's like, it's a different life for us. Like when Kelrick and I did our marathon, they closed down all the water stations and all the, and they took away the porta potties. And while the person who was like our sag wagon, who's the support and gear has to follow the last picture and kept trying to get me to quit like repeatedly. Wow. Right. So like, it's a different life. We're sort of like sharing resources, filling our water bottles at bars and Starbucks, like, but, um, it's been such a cool community to be a part of too. So I just feel grateful that this experience has given me like insight into that group of people. And I think there's something too, also about you kind of being a vanguard, like, um, first of your, you know, first of your flesh in these communities and like paving the way and showing people how you did it so they can do it a little easier their time. Like in 10 years, there could be a whole back of the pack iron fat course somewhere where they have 24 hours to finish it or whatever, right? Like there's so many options, especially as people continue to be empowered. That's where I think the real revolution is happening. It's not some event or overthrow. It's literally person by person um, going into places and teaching them, you know, just because you're fat doesn't mean you can't do the things that are on your heart, right? And it, like just, and it can be as simple as that to liberate someone to chase their dreams whether that be an iron man or something else. Yeah. And there are, I mean, there are fat, people fatter than me who are faster than me. There are people much thinner than me who are slower than I am. So part of it is like fat advocacy, right? Like I'm just going to show up fat and I'm going to refuse to leave. And even if I meet whatever your stereotype of me is like, that's on you. Like, I don't have to care about that, but also just in general, I think too many people use athletics as a way to like get their self-esteem by being better than somebody else. 
right? So you'll hear people say, well, if you can't run a marathon in five hours, you shouldn't bother. And I'm like, what are you about a five hour marathoner? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's what I expected. Right. Cause other people say, oh, if you can't do it in six hours, if you can't do it in four. And so it's this thing of like, I'm going to be okay with myself. Cause I'm better than other people at this thing. And what's true is like, my thing is nobody's obligated to participate in fitness, but everybody should be welcome. And so like, how can we make courses have longer or no time limits, right? Because a marathon is a distance. It's 26.2 miles. It's not a time. So like there's a group called Mainly Marathons, M-A-I-N-L-Y, and they do marathons around the country that have no time limit. It's how I did my second marathon and eventually got the Guinness World Record was with this group. Yay. Thank you. Additional medal. Um, but, but yeah, so like there are people out there doing it and it was the most fun, most diverse group I've ever been part of, you know, in any of the races that I've done 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, triathlons, because I think it was this group who was like committed to like, this is what we want to do. And there were people there, you know, they said their longest time to finish a marathon had been 15 hours. Mm. Right. And that was fine. And you get the last place person, which was me, you get a caboose medal. It's a separate, so you get your finisher's medal, but then you get a medal that's a caboose. And it's like my pride and joy, this medal. They're like, you were the very last person to finish that day. So anyway, yeah, I hope people can like more people who have the privilege and ability can get out there and advocate to make these sports more inclusive. Yeah. And also like having people like you, right. And other folks like just getting, getting your mind right. Cause uh, there's so much to, um, how we feel about ourselves. That is a mirror of how, of what we're ingesting, like what ideas about people we're ingesting. And so if you surround yourself with people who are empowered fat folks, right? Like that's kind of what I did when I was young, long before social media is when I was starting to just become self-actualized fat, right? Like loving myself no matter what. And, um, the more people I surround myself who are fat people who are capable, who are showing what's possible, that helps me realize, oh, okay, I can go do this thing and be the first to do this thing. And like, and hopefully I won't be the last. It's kind of the point. I want my life to make it easier for other people to live their lives. So I love that caboose medal. That's so good. Um, and I also, my favorite marathon joke, I think I've probably already told this to you, but uh, my favorite marathon joke is people run a 5k for their health. They run a marathon because their mom didn't love them enough. Um, which like goes to your point of athletes, like kind of training themselves and like needing to be good at this thing and like all of that kind of stuff. So, and I'm not saying that like, just cause you run an Ironman, you probably need therapy, but I am saying maybe, <laughs> maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe we all need therapy. I yeah. It's been interesting. Therapy. The people who are really good, you know, who do these sports have been incredibly supportive of me. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the internet trolls who have never done a 5k, let alone a marathon who want to like come for you and, and tell you, you shouldn't do it and do all this stuff. And so that has been a really nice lesson too. Like I have rarely been mistreated by another athlete on one of these courses. Um, you know, and like, you'll hear the, the pros like say, oh, if I couldn't get it done, couldn't get an Ironman done in eight hours, like I wouldn't do it. Like I can't imagine being out there for 17 hours on my feet, you know? So they talk about that too. It's a different kind of endurance. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Cause you know, we're, we're going about the same cadence uh, in a lot of cases. So like it's double the number of footfalls and, you know, double the amount of time. And so it's a different thing, but yeah, I really do want to be clear about that too. Now there are people definitely within the sport who try to be exclusive and the way that it's created is exclusive. But in terms of like who has face to face mistreated me, at least mm -hmm. it's not as much been other athletes. And that's really, that is an important distinction because like it, there's, there's so much uh, to be consoled about in terms of internet trolls and haters because nobody spends their time tearing someone else down who actually enjoys their life. Right. Um, you're always, you are, and, and I will say this to everyone listening to this, you are always doing better than the person, like emotionally and spiritually, than the person who is taking time out of their lives to come for you, to critique you, to yell at you, and um, to somehow try to tear you down because those people like it, when you are truly living out your destiny, you're too busy to care that much about what other people are doing. Oh, Reagan, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. That I was just saying that's beautifully said that like, I, I try to think about sometimes, you know, when I see these people who have like made a part-time job out of trolling me, like what would have to happen in my life 
that that is what I would spend this amount of time doing. And like, I can't imagine how bad my life would have to be before like, that's what I was doing. So I try to have at least some pity for that. Although their behavior is completely unacceptable and there's no amount of like compassion I would have that would make it okay for what they're doing. But it's just an interesting thing to ponder, I think. Yeah. And like, why spend the time being obsessed with someone you don't like and you could be watching Dolly Parton movies. You know what I mean? For real. There are people whose blogs I love that I don't always have time to read. I'm certainly not going to spend time like hate reading someone I think lies all the time and doesn't know anything. Like, why would I do that? Yeah, exactly. It it makes me, um, it's just, it makes me really sad actually for them. Um, and what's funny is like, I'm very love and light uh, and positivity, but I have a little Instagram stories highlight that's for haters and haters only. Um, And it's just to confront, it's like my own evil eye and it's just to confront them with their own shame. (laughs) It's like, you know, you gotta own your shadow self and I will fully just show the mirror to the people who are coming by to be a hater. Because the only people who click on a link that says haters are either people who are dealing with haters who need that that buoy, which is really who I'm here for. And then the people who are haters who just want to be hateful and are like, oh, what does Bevan want to say to the haters? This is what Bevan says, what Tupac says, which is anybody who's hating has been an enemy since day one. (laughs) Yeah, I just, I I will tell you a funny story that happened today, actually. So once upon a time, I did this 5k for fun with some friends and I didn't think it through. And I had to do a workout the night before, which I started to, I did most of my workouts after dark. Cause I am like, I avoid the sun like a vampire. Yeah. So my run ended and I only had like two hours until I, this 5k started. And for some reason, this run, I don't know if the socks or whatever gave me blisters. Mm. So now I have to do a 5k on these blisters. So the whole thing was just so painful and we're going through and um, uh, Jeanette to Patty was there. Marilyn Wong was there. Like people were out. And so I was like, we're going to do this. And so I finally see the finish line. I cross the finish line. They give me a medal. I take a picture. I go. And then I find out that I had done it wrong. Like I was supposed to go past the finish line around the path and cross it the other way. So I had cut the course. Um, and so of course, immediately I give back my medal. I tell them to disqualify me. Uh, But it turns out, of course, my trolls were there taking pictures and video at 7 a.m. for this 5K. So before I even knew what had happened, they were on Twitter talking about how I had like lied and cheated like for 98th place. I don't really understand why I would do that. But but so today somebody tagged me in a post and they were like, this is Reagan Chastain. She was caught taking an Uber to the finish of a 5K. An Uber. Wow. Yeah. So it like, it's like troll telephone, like that game you play when you're, but I was like, I'm not sure like the, the triumph there would have been getting the Uber onto the hike and bike trail Yeah, to drive me. Like that is really like where the accomplishment will be at, because I'm not real sure how they would get across the sand to get onto the hike and bike trail to drive me to the end of the 5k. But like points to me, a rumor started for a while that I had done my whole marathon on a scooter a mobility scooter. And I was like, no shame in a mobility scooter, but let me give you a little lecture on batteries and how long they last and how, what would have to happen to do 26.2 miles on a mobility scooter. Like let's here, let me educate you. And so everybody who sent me that got like two paragraphs on scooter batteries. And like, oh but yeah, it gets, I, I try to at least find some entertainment from it. Right. So you're very entertained by it. And I love that. I also, you know, here's the thing. I like you a lot. Um, I would totally hang out with you. I don't know that I would get up at 7 a.m. to go like meet you on a race course, let alone to hate watch you on a race course. Like getting up that early, like I don't even really like to get up that early for my mom and she like needs my favors sometimes. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, it's real. The commitment, I call them my there before the grace of whatever fan club. Yeah. Because really at some point when you're like spending that kind of time creating websites, showing up at events, like you're a fan at that point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes fan fiction, sometimes they're more of a fan fiction club, but whatever, like we take what we can get. That's wild. I'm, uh, I'm glad that you have such good humor about it. I feel like Reagan, you and I are very different personalities because I am not (laughs) trophy motivated. I do not want to do any movement that does not bring me joy. I'm a big fan of also try it and quit, right? Or try it and do 10 minutes and then come back and do 15, right? Like just do what you need to do, right? But, um, and also the, the worthy opponent part I get too, like if you're, um, 
I used to quit things if I wasn't good right away. That was the thing I used to really do because I needed back when I was an overachiever perfectionist and I needed accomplishments to like help me feel good about myself before I recognized, oh, I'm just here and I can be inherently valuable if I choose to be. And, uh, and I don't need to prove anything. Now, like when something isn't easy at first, I really dig into like my why. Do I have a reason like that I started? And so I'm going to keep going. I have a million excuses that makes it hard, but I really do love a worthy opponent and like keeping something moving. Like, you know, like being an entrepreneur, like being self-employed means you have to kick your own butt or you don't get paid. Um, and you got to like keep it, keep the rubber to the road somehow, some way. Um, so I think you really have a lot of tenacity in you, Reagan, which I love. Um, what are things that like um, bring you a lot of joy these days in the middle of quarantine? Oh, let's see. In quarantine, I am really overjoyed that. So Julianne, my fiance and I are quarantining together in a very small house um, and we have been fully committed. So no one in and not going out except for necessary medical and bed appointments. So we have been like in this small house together and it has gone really well. So I feel like really good about our relationship because I feel like, like some people were not so lucky. So I feel really happy about that. Um, our little dogs always bring me joy. They're ridiculous, um, but also fabulous. They have their own Instagram that has like seven followers, but it brings me joy to post pictures of them online. Um, and I've, I started doing, cause I, right before I went into quarantine, I was doing more stand up. Uh, I do, I've been doing speaking full time for going on nine years now. And after every talk, somebody's like, Oh, have you thought about doing stand up comedy? Uh, and I use a lot of humor cause I talk about really heavy things and like, you just can't lecture people for an hour about like horrible things. I, I find at least I can't successfully. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I think I maybe will try cause I love stand up, love it. And so I was doing like some open mics and then, um, obviously we went into quarantine. So I started doing this little quarantine comedy videos from my house and that's been really fun and, uh, got asked to join Fatch, the fat sketch comedy group. Ooh. I know. So amazing. I can't even believe it. Uh, so I'm getting to like start working with them and work on sketches. I submitted my first sketch and like, we're doing some stuff online. So that's been really fun. Oh, yay. I love that. I'd love to hear uh, about the comedy. I'm excited for, I like people who have good politics, who do who, good politics or politics that vibe with me, I should say, and no rape jokes, which I'm assuming you're probably not doing that. Uh, not so much. You're smart. And this is the thing. I just think that's lazy comedy, right? Like yeah. th things where you're using punching down and oppression humor is lazy. Uh, it takes a lot of work to actually come up with things that are funny about stuff that isn't just like easy, right? So I love that. Oh, and I love that you're working with fat. What a great group of fat, magical people. Um, they are super fabulous. Oh, yay. Uh, will you tell me more of something that you're very smart about? I wanted to make sure to get on the podcast because I think this is going to add a ton of value to people is what you suggest doing when you're fat at the doctor. Cause I think medical fat phobia is something many of us deal with and like kind of surrender to in many ways. Cause I don't think everyone understands how self-possessed they can be when it comes to that, the medical industrial complex. So I'm curious what your top tools are for medical stuff. Awesome. Let's go. Okay. So, uh, first of all, realize that like all fat phobia, medical fat phobia is not your fault though. It becomes our problem, mm -hmm. right? It's not our fault. There's nothing wrong with our bodies. There's nothing wrong with fat people existing. There's things deeply wrong in the healthcare system at every level, right? At medical school, at the peer reviewed journals that publish these embarrassing weight loss studies, in research and development, in training, in application, in the chairs that they're ordering, in the beds that they make, in the surgical tools they create, there's fat phobia at every level of medical care. Um, and often we're left to overcome it um, or suffer ourselves. And so part of what I try to ask people is understanding that this shouldn't be happening. You shouldn't have to do it. The question that I ask myself is how much am I willing to let this harm me? Mm. And how much can I pull to fight against it? Not just me, but like advocates and friends and whoever I can pull into my team. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a big question to ask. How much am I, you know, willing in as much as I'm capable to allow this to harm me? 
in terms of one-on-one -on -one with doctors, so there's, you can search for uh, fat-friendly, weight-inclusive doctors, and there are a lot of them. Um, Everything Endocrine online, Fat Doctor UK, Louise Metz. Uh, these are all Hayes-based doctors. Uh, Jennifer uh, Gaudani, there are a lot of them. Uh, around, but perhaps not where you are. So you can try to find uh, a Hayes-based doctor. You can also um, talk to your doctor about research and evidence, if that's something that you're interested in. I certainly do that. Uh, it's a way that I can use my privilege at the doctor's office. Um, you can also, to me, sort of the magic question to bypass fat phobia without having to have a big discussion is, well, what do you give thin people who have this issue? because there are interventions that aren't weight loss. And I know that because thin people get these health issues and they get those interventions, right? So thin people with type two diabetes are not asked to surgically mutilate their stomach to put it into a disease state to force behaviors that mimic an eating disorder. That's not considered a reasonable treatment for them. They have other treatments. So let, let's have some of those. Mm -hmm. And so that to me is a big part of it. And sometimes like first, <laughs> Disclaimer, lying to your doctor is really dangerous and is not something you should have to do, but sometimes I have found that it is. So I might say, I will absolutely start on this diet. I can't wait to start putting pretzels in hundred calorie baggies when I get home. But in the meantime, uh, <laughs> what would you do for a thin person who has this issue? And maybe we can start that now, right? Since this diet is going to take a little bit of time to get me down to my goal weight. So like, let's start an actual, you know, evidence-based ethical intervention right now. Uh, so that can be a, kind of a helpful way to do that. Um, and then I, uh, Louise Metz and Tiana Dodson and I just launched a project called Hayes Health Sheets. So it's H-A-E-S healthsheets.com. And they're diagnosis specific sheets that literally talk about all the weight neutral interventions for specific health conditions and why weight loss would not be an appropriate um, recommendation as well as like a resource bank of evidence and links in case that's helpful. So we're hoping that they can be used by patients and advocates and practitioners to advocate for specific conditions. Because I hear just from a lot of people who they were really strong on their like fat positive health at every size journey. And then they get a medical diagnosis and it kind of all falls apart, right? Because it's like, maybe it's true. Maybe everything I heard is true. Maybe it is my fat body. And that's just never the case. So those, I guess, are my top tips. Those are hot tips. I'm like, <laughs> we got to write these down. This is good. Um, I love that. And also, um, as someone who like was like thick in my like fat, my early fat activism, and then I got a weight related diagnosis. Um, it was called pseudo tumor cerebri, where like my body was acting like I had a brain tumor and it was just like fluid not draining into my spinal column. Uh, it was making me lose my vision, uh, like could have permanently gone uh, blind. It was really scary. And like, of course I was only treated, uh, for, for weight. And you know, what's interesting is that doctor was like, he's like, you don't need to lose much. He's like, you lose like two to 5% of your body fat, which is pretty easy to lose. And that's true. I mean, you can make some minor lifestyle changes. And I was like, great, but also what else are we going to do? And so he, and this is before I really even had this language. Um, but he like gave me, um, some kind of medicine that like made it, it made all my extremities numb. Uh, and it was like the same thing they give to climbers who are going up in altitude. And so it made all my extremities numb. It made me fall asleep all the time. Um, and so then I was just really motivated to just like, and I really just had to shift my lifestyle a little bit because I had gotten that disease while I was studying for the bar exam, which was literally the worst health I've ever been in. Um, was just, and nobody owes anybody health, but like I was actively not prioritizing any level of body care. And so I got sick. I mean, shocked. Right. And so like, I can kind of see it now with like more understanding of how that arc went, but like, it was also just really frustrating to have yet another doctor, like tell me, oh, you've got to treat this with weight loss. And then eventually I kind of was like, okay, you know, like I get it. And I don't think it's about weight loss. I think it was more to do with like what I was putting in my body versus like what I needed to shed from my body. Right. Um, uh -huh. So this is a super interesting thing because you hear all the time, oh, 5% weight loss gives you clinically uh, proven benefits. And in fact, there's no clinically proven. Tell me. So what happened is attrition. Hmm. So it started with the Metropolitan Insurance Company's weight and health tables. And this is a group that said that the depression might have been good because it forced people to eat less, right? So probably not a group that I want to be involved in the weight and health discussion. But they made these tables very specific height and weight. Mm. except doctors were not able to get people to lose enough weight. 
And so then they changed it to 20%, not based on clinical anything. It was like literally the rectal pole throws dart, like 20% sounds like a lot. But doctors couldn't get people to lose 20% of their body weight. So they went down to 10. But doctors couldn't get people to lose 10% of their body weight. So now we've arrived at five. And what we found in Man and Tomiyama talk about this in their 2013 paper is that, so what happens is somebody makes some behavior changes. They lose a little bit of weight, very likely temporarily, and then they have health changes. But for some reason, even though the weight loss was both small and simultaneous, we credit the weight loss with the health benefits and not the behavior changes. Even though good studies, Matheson et al., Way et al., the Cooper Institute Longitudinal Studies, Barry et al., show that habits are a much better predictor of health than is body size. Mm -hmm. Right. So diet culture, what diet culture does is say weight, like fat bodies are bad. Weight loss is good. Don't listen to what the evidence says. And so we get this a lot where doctors are like, oh, well, if you lose 5% of your body weight, you know, that will solve whatever problem you have. And in fact, it's very likely the behavior changes that are having that effect. Right. And a lot of people gain back their weight, but they keep the behavior changes and they keep the health benefits that they got. And so that's something that's really frustrating to me. Like if you scratch the surface of that, it doesn't make any sense. Why would a tiny bit of weight loss simultaneously cause, and why aren't we looking at the behavior changes at all? Why are we acting like, especially since like, if you get, if you lose weight a different way, like say through liposuction, no health benefits. Right. So there's, this is, I will, I, I teach a whole hour and a half workshop on this. So I'm going to step right off this soapbox right now. But like that, the whole thing is like such a ridiculous mess. And I'm telling you, if I had done this stuff in college, I would have been sitting with the dean and she would have been like, yeah, there are a lot of majors here and you should pick a different one. Like you don't understand this on a real fundamental level. And yet it's getting published in peer reviewed journals all the time. Oh my God. That's so fascinating. I'd love I just love that you exist, Reagan. I'm glad you have all of this in your brain and that you can, and someone out there can hire you to come in and do this workshop for their institution or company or just as a group party. Why not? Why not hire Reagan Chastain for your birthday party? Uh, That's what I've never done. That would be amazing. Oh my gosh. I have, I have done a Facky dance party, private birthday party. I've done a couple. Um, but frankly, I think Reagan Chastain uh, teaching about health at every size is exactly what, what the world needs. Um, oh, I don't know. Maybe both. We could maybe. do a package birthday party deal. First education, then dance it out. Yes. I think oh, what you do is amazing. I'm so, I'm so happy that you exist in the world and that you do what you do. So I think we should like package it up as a birthday party. I Find rock. a fat clown. We'll rock Jennifer Janatson. Like we could do this. This could be a thing. We get fat to perform. Yeah, for real. <laughs> This great online fatty experience. Um, I'm doing an Airbnb experience for my friend's birthday uh, to the Aurora Borealis. Uh, so it says that, so I don't even have to be cold and I get to go <laughs> to the Aurora Borealis. I'm excited. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, okay, so you uh, talk a lot about health at every size. Give me your quick definition of health at every size. To me, so. I'm not sure that there's a really quick definition. When people ask me to define health, the point is that there's no definition. Mm. It's different for different people. People have different baselines for health. And anytime we try to define it, it becomes really elusive or we have to exclude a bunch of people. Mm. Um, and so to me, health at every size is about saying like we should each get, so first of all, health, not an obligation, not a barometer of worthiness, not entirely within our control. Mm -hmm. So knowing those things, uh, for our personal decisions, we should get to choose how we prioritize our health and the path we take to get there. And the job of public health is to make sure that those things are accessible to us and to make sure there are no barriers to health. So like currently racism, public health crisis, mm -hmm. but we treat it like an inconvenience that, you know, people of color have to deal with. So the right now public health is in a large part about making the individual's health, the public's business in ways that increase marginalizations, fat phobia, racism, ableism, ageism. And in fact, public health should be about creating access and decreasing barriers to the health behaviors that people want to participate in. I, totally. I think there, it's funny. There's like five social determinants of health and three are things that like have everything to do with economic situation and not to do with even your physical body. Um, and, and so that's like, whoever gets access to health is inherently like blocked and biased in so many fundamental ways. Um, yeah. oh, I love that. Uh, 
and Reagan also eating disorders. I wanted to talk to you about this. So I have been just like as a, a person in the world really ruminating on this. I think that eating disorders are frequently only diagnosed. I mean, I, I think the numbers are there that they're frequently only diagnosed in like thin, uh, privileged, like economically privileged white women. Um, primarily, right? When you think about eating disorders. But I actually think that the way diet culture raises us is if you're raised in any way with diet culture, you are very unlikely to leave it without some level of disordered eating. Would you agree? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So diets in and of themselves are a form of disordered eating. And within eating disorders community, it has been a huge issue that like thin, cis, rich, white, younger women are the ones getting treatment and attention. And it, it continues to be a problem. Um, I resigned from, I was an ambassador for the National Eating Disorders Association, NIDA, because they were giving face time to a commitment of expanding this, but not actually expanding it. Mm. Because the money is coming from, in large part, rich people whose thin cis ha, white daughters had eating disorders. So, like, there's a huge layer there that kind of has to be peeled back. And while I have tremendous sympathy and compassion for those people, that doesn't mean that they should get to gatekeep eating disorders world for just those people who are, remind them of their kids. Uh, beyond that, um, what we're seeing more in eating disorders is. Uh, they're opening up, it'll be an eating disorders clinic that opens up a weight management clinic. It's like literally we're prescribing to people in this building, the exact behaviors we're telling this group of people are dangerous and that they need to stop, which is a problem for everybody, right? Because it tells, so folks who have eating disorders see like, oh no, if you're fat, these behaviors are completely reasonable and I have a fear of becoming fat. So like, let's just do what they're telling us to do, right? So this is a huge issue that we aren't talking about. And then in general, eating disorders have often been defined by size. So like to get, when I got my eating disorder diagnosis, I was EDNOS, which is the old term it was called. Uh, it was um, eating disorders not otherwise specified. Oh. And the reason was that I wasn't quote unquote underweight enough to get another diagnosis. And so now they're calling it, if you're fat and you um, have all of the symptoms of anorexia, they call it atypical anorexia. And by atypical, they mean, oh, fat phobia told us that this didn't exist, right? It's like calling it the obesity paradox. It's only a paradox if you refuse to admit you were wrong in the first place. It's only atypical if you refuse to admit that you were ignoring these folks in the first place, right? Because fat people with eating disorders are often encouraged. I was, I've never been more encouraged than when I was at the sickest mm -hmm. in terms of the way that I was dealing with food and movement. And so this is like fat phobia perpetuates eating disorders and fat phobia within eating disorders uh, treatment can impair recovery and it can make or impair treatment rather and make full recovery almost impossible for folks. Do you think it's possible for people to pursue recovery from eating from disordered eating, whether or not they like if they never get a diagnosis, like, um, I just think about like how, I mean, I never really had access just financially even to the treatment that I would need to deal with my eating disorder or my disordered eating behaviors, but they have I've worked with them mostly because I did so much work on my body image and like and my own personal definitions of what does health mean for me what, what kind of life do I enjoy and how does how does food enjoyment play within this yeah yeah I do there are a lot of sort of different levels within disordered eating and eating disorders it's definitely a scale it's not a like a binary and so for some folks like inpatient treatment is the best thing. For some folks, they can work one-on-one -on -one with a uh, therapist or counselor, a uh, haze-based nutritionist, and really find their way out of that. Um, so it really depends. And like you said, cost is such a huge issue. Eating disorder treatment centers, and this is like a personal pet peeve, tend to be built on some of the most expensive real estate in the country, right? And then they're built to look like these amazing spas, and they're incredibly expensive just to maintain. And this is for some people who have one of the deadliest uh, mental illnesses that exist, right? We make cost of barriers so that we can have beautiful treatment centers in ex beautiful, expensive locations. That makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. There's a better way to do that, right? And so a lot of the cost, I think, is completely unnecessary and is based on this thing that, like, this is an industry, basically, quote unquote, that 
is made to serve wealthy white people mm -hmm. and exclude everyone else. So I think we need more and more people doing this work outside of that. Um, but yeah, I do think people can find their way out of disordered eating and eating disorders in different ways if they're if they don't have access to treatment. I just think everyone should have access to the treatment that they want. Oh, 100 percent. I think everyone yeah. should have access to the treatment, but I think the treatment needs to. I, I love the work of Project Heal. Um, I taught at their they did a camp called Camp Heal for people who are in actively in their eating disorder recovery. And I taught my aerobics class there in a self-love workshop, and it was so good. And Project Heal has, um, you know, grassroots uh, groups of in different locations. And the whole point was to kind of make it more equitable uh, for eating disorder treatment. Um, and I'm excited to see like what continues to flourish from that. But I just kind of felt like there's, I just don't see how people's eating isn't profoundly affected by diet culture and like the, and food restriction. I mean, I was on Weight Watchers at eight years old, which every time I tell that story, I love my mother. I think she's amazing. She worked so hard. She did the best she could with me, but I believe it is child abuse to put your kid on a diet at that young age. And yeah. it just, it screwed with me forever. You know what I mean? And so many people I know who have eating disorders, literally their root is Weight Watchers. It's not, it's not dieting. It's Weight Watchers, specifically that brand, which is why whenever I talk about like, I, I only want Fatty Dance Party to be a billion dollar business simply because I want to take that entire billion dollars away from Weight Watchers. Just is a personal vendetta. <laughs> yes, yes, that would be great. Thank you. Do that. I am here for it. Yeah, it's the way that we deal with food is like such a mess. Like, and and it does. Like, I agree with you. Like, even though parents have the best of intentions, it's absolutely child abuse to do that to your kid physically to give your kid less food than they need to survive in the hopes that their body eats itself and becomes smaller. Not ethical or evidence-based and then socially putting your kid in a place where they have to interact with food differently than all the kids around them is so not okay like the whole thing is a mess and I I just hate that parents are given such terrible information about it you know you see pediatricians you know weighing babies and telling them oh your baby's too big try fitting their formula with water like what are you doing no yeah, like there's a diversity of body sizes, just like there's a diversity of height and nose sizes and hand sizes and eye width and like, let it go. Yeah, so I'm trying to control it from the time that they're a fetus and like, let people just live. Yeah. And like, also with metabolism too, like, I think there's like, the earlier you restrict food, the more likely you are to have a slow metabolism. Yeah. I think, I mean, you probably know the research way better than me, I feel like. Yeah. So weight cycling is like, so weight cycling is yo-yo dieting, right? And it's the most common result of more than one a diet attempt, right? Most people lose weight, then they gain it back. And the diet industry just takes the lose weight part and says, see, we did that. And then when you gain it back. They say, oh, you're bad. Like you went back to your old habits or whatever, which is a strange way to say starvation is unsustainable, but okay. Mm -hmm. So then they say, it's okay. Just go on another diet. So lose a little weight, gain back. And up to two thirds of people, about 95% fail, but up to two thirds of those gain back more than they lost. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really good way to increase your body size over time. It's not a really good way. That's the only thing that intentional weight loss attempts are proven to do well is to increase body size over time. And unfortunately, weight cycling is independently associated with most of the health conditions that we also associate with people just having fat bodies. Mm. And so it's entirely possible that what we actually have is an epidemic of weight cycling and an epidemic of uh, body shaming and weight stigma, both of which are correlated with those same health conditions. Mm. So we don't know how to make fat people thin. We do know how to stop telling them to go on diets and we do know how to stop stigmatizing them. So I'm like, maybe we give that the old college try, like see how it works. We have no idea what fat people's health outcomes would look like if we had equal access to ethical evidence-based healthcare. Yes. Right. Instead of you going with a severed limb and they prescribe you a diet drug. What are you <laughs> doing? Right. If we actually got the same kind of care that, you know, and the same goes for other people in marginalized bodies, right? Racism is incredibly impactful on healthcare. Mm -hmm. But what we hear is, oh, black people are at greater risk as if their blackness is the issue and not the racism that they experience. Like it's, it, it's an issue for a lot of different marginalized communities. Yeah. I feel like there's just, you know, when, when is the justice? Um, the, I'm curious. Okay. So I want to give you an award before we wrap this all up. 
because I know you love trophies and you love awards. And I just want to give you the award for the most diligent person I know on social media, making memes of your (laughs) smart things that you say every time. Like it's the, specifically it's the fat kid dance party account loves your algorithm. And so like, I'll log into it and poof, there's another excellent meme by Reagan. I share them all the time because they're so good. And I like to remind my people um, how worthy their bodies are and how bullshit the medical industrial complex is. But um, I just appreciate you. This, this is a metaphysical trophy from me to you. Oh, for thank you. Great, consistent use of meme image. I know all of us who are content creators trying to create a thing and stay relevant to the algorithm are like, oh, I should do memes, you know, and then, <laughs> and then don't. <laughs> But you do it. You do the memes. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the Academy and Canva and the Instagram. Autumn. No, <laughs> to me, like, that's a lot of where, like, I can do my activism because a big, like, my thing, the reason why I want to do comedy, the reason why I speak, the reason why I did a blog is I just want people to have the option, right? You can love your body right now, right? Or like your body or come to a neutral place in your body, whatever you want to do, like without weight loss, and you can pursue health outside of weight loss. And so like, this is one of the ways that I can do that is to keep putting these little thoughts into the world. And so like, when I started, it was a lot of like, labels and stamps. And like, that was sort of the the daily work of activism, right to mail stuff out. So now to me, the daily work is like, figuring out like how to make this a catchy like picture in Canva and figuring out when should I post it. And like, all of that is now the work of getting the word out. Mm. I mean, but you're doing it. Excellent acceptance speech. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Okay. So Reagan, how can people find you on the internet and stay in touch with you? Okay. So probably the easiest thing to do is go to danceswithfat.org. And then at the top, you'll see all my uh, social media accounts and you can kind of see um, everything I do from there. My YouTube account, if you want to watch my comedy videos, uh, that's probably the easiest place to, because my name is spelled strangely and it's hard to find. So danceswithfat.org. Great. And then what is your dog Instagram account? Uh, It's the Royale, R-O-Y-A-L-E, dogs. Oh, nice. We want them, we have Chad Chanel Royale and Cuddles Mick Pick Me Up Royale, and we really want them to get into the house of Latrice Royale, which is why we, we aspirationally named them. Oh, I love that. In the hopes that. that she will accept them into her house. Oh, I, I wonder if, do- if drag moms accept cute dogs into their houses. I hope so. I Fingers would. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. Reagan, you're such a delight. Thank you so much for being here, sharing your wisdom with everybody. I am like speaking for them when I say, I know you've changed lives today. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do. I, I'm just grateful to like get to be a little part of what you're doing. So thank you very, very much. Yay.